Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. Now, I got a question from one of our fellow engineers, Denis. I assume you're from France. He asked this really poignant question that I, that I thought I'd cover in this video because it allows me to riff on something that I don't talk about too much, but I think is really interesting. So Denis says, hi, Esco, love your channel. We all need less voodoo. Always, always less voodoo. I, <laughs> I was wondering, we always talk about the room being small and dealing with the walls being too close, but what about a room being too big? My drum room has a high slanted ceiling with a mezzanine on the second floor, and this question has always been in the back of my mind. Thanks, best Denis. Now, I love this question because we talk about rooms being too small all the time, right? For reasons of just lack of space and then the danger of kind of over damping, making the room sounding too dead, reflections causing problems, uh, standing waves, room modes messing up our low end. And then for recording rooms, just having that issue of like the small room sound, right? But what about a room being too big? What happens to those same issues as the room size increases? And is there maybe a new problem or do new problems pop up that you need to be aware of and you need to take care of? So let's dive into that in this video. But before I do that, if you are in the process of building out your studio, treating your studio, building a home studio, and you need to get an idea of the bigger picture of the, the path that you need to follow in order to get your room to translate, get your mixes to translate, I want you to check out my home studio treatment framework, which you can download for free at the link in the description. These are my five steps to treating a home studio and getting it to translate. So it's all the kind of steps that you need to take to get your room up to a standard where you can actually work reliably and fast without having to think about sound all the time, right? So it's, it's all in there. It's how to set up your desk, your speakers, speaker decoupling, but also treatment, so porous absorption, resonance absorption, subwoofers, measurements, it's all in there laid out for you in a process that you can follow. So no matter what kind of state your room is in and where you are in your home studio treatment journey, you can figure out and you can find out exactly what step you need to take next in order to really move the needle in the right direction, right? So this is my home studio treatment framework, which you can download for free at the link in the description. But so coming back to the question of whether a room can be too big, the short answer is no, not really. And the, the, the reason is that all the typical issues that I just mentioned that we are dealing with in small rooms just kind of disappear eventually as the room gets bigger. Yeah, There's one potential issue with increased reverb times in these big spaces, but as you'll see, that's not really that much of a problem, and I'll, I'll talk about that more in a second. But let's dive into the, these actual individual problems that we're dealing with and see what happens to them as we increase the room size. First up, the lack of space for treatment. and. This is pretty easy, it's pretty obvious, right? The room size increases, and so you have more space for treatment in this room. Obviously, that also means that we need more absorption in the space in this room in order to get the reverb times down to a level that is suitable for like mixing kind of control room purposes. But there's a caveat here, right? So just as a thought experiment, Imagine you're setting up your, your mixing setup, your desk and speakers in an empty opera house, right? So you're, you're setting up on stage with the, your back to the audience. You've got the entire stage around you and then that gigantic audience space behind you. Such a space will easily have multiple seconds of reverb time and you'll probably have a hard time actually getting that down to the kind of typical 0.3 or whatever seconds or less even for a control room. But the thing is you wouldn't need to do that either, right? Because that reverb is so diffuse and it's more importantly, so late in relation to the direct sound from your speakers that it would hardly have any impact on them. You'd still hear 
the reverb in that space, but it wouldn't actually affect the sound from your speakers all that much. And so you'd probably be able to mix just fine. But so in practice, basically as the room size increases, you get these longer and longer and longer, longer reverb times just because of the volume of the space. But you also have the space to actually deal with it and treat that reverb time and bring it back down. So up to a certain point, this game actually works in our favor, right? So we increase the size and we get more, more and more space for treatment until we have the, enough space to do all the treatment we need, but without having excessive space in the room that just is just going to cost us money and time to deal with. And that's kind of where that ideal balance lies in terms of room size. And that's and that, that's uh, different for every designer depending on kind of their approach and, and how they like to treat rooms. But going beyond that size into kind of even bigger rooms, you basically cross over into a realm where the space is so big, the reverb times are so long that it just doesn't really make sense to try and, and kind of uh, clamp down on that reverb time and reduce it down to what you need for control room levels, right? So like in this example of the opera house from before, yeah? But you'd probably still be able to get a good mixing setup and a good sound from your speakers because of what I just mentioned. So let's see in more detail why that is, starting with reflections, the second point on my list here. And let me switch to this example in Amray. This is a kind of a ray tracing application that you can use to simulate how sound reflects in a room. And so I've got a, a, a a small room here. This is maybe what six meters by four meters, I believe, something like that. Yeah, so it's not a, a tiny room, but it's definitely a small room, acoustically speaking. Yeah, and it's actually simulating our first order reflections. Yeah, we've got our speaker here and then the listening position here. And if I actually go and uh, move my mouse across these little lines in the impulse response down here, you can see it highlighting those first order reflections beyond the direct sound, right? So first order reflections because they just bounce off of one surface coming back to the listening position. The important part about this is the ratio between the direct sound, which is highlighted right here now, and the reflections, or rather the path length of those reflections. The important thing here is obviously if you increase the room size around you, that direct sound, that distance will remain the same. You're always going to set up your speakers in the near field, but the reflection paths of those first order reflections is going to increase massively as in this second example here. Yeah, so this is now, I don't even remember what this was, maybe 15 meters by, I don't know, 12, 14, something like that. doesn't really matter. The point is, just look, look at how much longer the reflection paths are in relation to the direct sound. And so you're basically improving that ratio in your favor as the room gets bigger. And as these reflections have to travel longer, they will be delayed in time and they will be lower in volume in relation to the direct sound, which makes their impact on what you're hearing that much lesser, right? And at, at some point, they are so late and so quiet that you can basically you basically can't tell that they're there anymore. So in a nutshell, the bigger the room gets around you, the less the impact of these first order reflections becomes up to the point where the room is so big that you we're not really talking about first order reflections anymore. They just kind of meld into what makes up the diffuse reverb of the space. Yeah, like I was talking about before in this example of the the opera uh, the opera house. So then let's look at the third aspect that I mentioned, which are standing waves, aka room modes. Yeah, These are the resonances that build up in small rooms and kind of wreak havoc on the low end. It's one of the most uh, problematic aspects of acoustics in small rooms. But basically what happens here is that as the room size increases, the frequencies at which these room modes potentially build up shift down in frequency up to the point where they shift down so low that they're outside of the audible spectrum and they just, again, stop being an issue. And at that point, the, the acoustics that makes up the sound in the auditory spectrum 
is basically completely made up of reflections because standing waves just moved out of the way, if you will. So again, let's have a look at an example of what this looks like in practice. All right, so I've got three rooms set up here. We'll start with this one, which is fairly small. I've done this in feet now just for convenience. And what we're seeing are these lines that make up the individual room modes in this space. And as you can see, it kind of starts at 31 hertz down here. And then as we move up in frequency, you get more and more of these at di in different patterns until the point where they are, they are so tight together that we can't really distinguish individual modes anymore. But the point here is that this, this graph basically calculates this for us up to around 220 hertz. Let's see what happens when we double the room size, right? Going from a length of 18 and a height of 10, yeah, double, so 36 up to a height, a height of 20 feet, yeah, big space. So now this graph here basically stops at 85 hertz, yeah, and also notice just how, how much less of these lines there are in comparison to this one, yeah? The lowest one now sits here down at like 15 hertz. And so basically this, this entire graph here only shows us in a, in, a, in a way what happened up to about here in this smaller room. And if we go even bigger, so double again, yeah, so 36 and uh, length of 36 feet, 20 feet height, double that again, 72 feet, 40 feet height, so a very large space, yeah, this graph now stops at 30 hertz, right? So all this, this one here is at 7.8 hertz. This is not a problem anymore for any room, any speaker, any room, any sub, yeah? Even the ones that come above it, right? This only really starts, they potentially only start showing up maybe up here, right? So we've only got a few of these that, that happen in the audible spectrum and everything above that is just c consists of reflections. So again, as you can see, as the room gets bigger, this room mode issue becomes less and less of a problem, yeah? up to the point where the room is so big that you may only have to deal with one or two particular frequencies where you still have room mode issues and they will be very low down in frequency. And then eventually it stops being an issue altogether. But again, this is really talking about very large spaces. So like that opera house that I mentioned before. Yeah? If we're thinking about this ideal room that I mentioned where we have enough space for treatment, but we're not trying to deal with an excessively large space, you still have to very much take care of room modes, but that's factored in into the treatment that you plan for the treatment of this room. So then what does that actually mean for mixing rooms and recording or live rooms? Well, for mixing rooms, it's pretty simple, right? The, the larger the room becomes, the more space we have for treatment. All the while, the actual issues that we're dealing with become less, less impactful, yeah? Up to a certain point where it doesn't really make sense to increase the room size anymore because you're basically dealing with a, a gigantic uh, opera house or theater or concert hall or whatever. On the recording or live room side, you still get all these benefits. But there's one bonus on top of that, and that is that the constraints, the restrictions, whatever you want to call them, to treating such a space are much more relaxed in comparison to a, a mixing setup or a room for a mixing setup, aka a control room, right? I mean, treating a recording space, a live room, is pure art, yeah? You get to decide what type of sound you want in your recording room. There's no right or wrong here, yeah? If you want to record in a concrete bunker, yeah, all the more power to you. But so basically what I want you to take away here is, is that in a nutshell, the bigger the room, the better, yeah? It's as simple as that. In hardly any circumstance does increasing the size make things worse. If nothing else, then just because you have more space for acoustic treatment. So I hope you learned something from that. Again, if you haven't already, make sure you download my home studio treatment framework. But with that, let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you soon.